Welcome everyone to this week's uh, episode of the Ronin Seminar Series. We've got uh, Marios Kyriasis today, and he is going to be talking about a system science perspective on aging. Please uh, take it away, Marios. Hi. I'm a biomedical gerontologist, which means that I am... Um, hi, Josh. I am... Um, I'm a medical doctor, but I'm also interested in the biology of aging. And I try to combine the two aspects of these um, disciplines to see if we can find ways to diminish the impact of age-related diseases on, on people. So I'm going to talk about this um, reductionism versus systems thinking in aging, trying to say that um, we have to develop a new way of seeing the aging problem. Otherwise, in my view, we are not going to get anywhere. So I'll, uh, I'll put the screen share now with my slides. Hopefully they're somewhere here. First of all, I would like to say that we need to move away from uh, seeing aging as a purely biomedical or biological problem. Aging is not a matter of biology alone, but it is also a matter of um, other issues like technology, society, culture, language, and um, evolutionary matters as well. So I'll, I'll see um, a few definitions of aging. Depending on the point of view, if, if you're a biologist, for me, aging is the imperfect repair of time-related damage. In other words, our body is subjected to damage due to various reasons. And uh, we lose the ability to repair that damage. And that's, that's what aging is. But I'm more interested in the medical sense, in the clinical sense. And I see aging as time-related dysfunction. In other words, we don't really care, if you think about it, what, how our body is affected, whether the enzymes are more or less, or the cells move a bit to the left or not. What we care in the whole issue of aging is the function of the, pair of the person. So if we are able to function properly and do whatever we like in life, um, there is no problem. But if the passage of time causes us to uh, function badly, then this, this is what I call aging. I'll say a few things about reductionism now. I'm sure you know it all, but I'll um, uh, say something. In reductionism, we decompose a concept. We take a, a problem and we simplify it. And um, we want to try to make it easily solvable. We, we try to study the individual component of the, of, the, of the whole issue. And that's, I think, the mistake we are doing in aging. We are trying to take individual components of aging, uh, like cells, DNA, and so on, and study them in isolation. That's what I think we've been doing wrong all this time. If we approach aging in a reductionist manner, we will uh, see, we'll be in the situation that we are now. In other words, there are no opportunities, no real opportunities to, to discover something new or offer a practical way to people uh, in order to diminish the impact of aging. There are many, all I would say, scientists that are involved Okay, I won't say all, but I'd say 95% of scientists that are involved in aging follow this paradigm, the, the reductionist mechanistic approach. I don't know why, maybe it's a matter of culture, maybe there are the deeper reasons which we won't go into now, but uh, there exist alternative models which, if properly researched, they can lead into a widespread reduction or even elimination of age-related diseases in humans. And I'll discuss some of these models here. So in systems thinking, we 
uh, don't look at the individual components of the system in isolation, but we look at the relationships that exist between the different parts of the system, and then um, how these different parts of, 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 the, of the entire system uh, depend on each other in order to give the final um, property of the system. Now we move into a quite fashionable subject, the search for the elixir of youth. Elixir in my terminology is something that if you give it, it it's, a, it's a, um, not necessarily a liquid, but it's an item that has therapeutic um, properties. You give it to somebody and they get rid of the, of the disease or the problem they have. Here we talk about the elixir of youth. In other words, it's a simplified term that describes struggle for the discovery of the of a drug that can reduce the impact of aging. And this has been going on, of course, for millennia. We see the alchemists that's been trying to discover something, um, people doing uh, experiments with uh, testicles of dogs and monkeys and so on. But in today's high-tech society, we still have the same paradigm, only we use uh, more refined and more technological terminology, like rejuvenation biotechnologies, um, stem cells, drugs, and senescence drugs, and so on. These are terms which describe one item, it's an item, something that we can take in our hands, it's, it's, it's a treatment, it's a therapy. Uh, it's not something more abstract, as we should see later on. Before we go into the more um, complex way of seeing aging, I would like to separate aging into two different but related processes. One is the process of aging itself that is the, the basic biological process that all scientists try to diminish or reduce. And the other is the diseases that are related to this process. So we have, all of us have the process of aging going on inside us. Some of us develop diseases, some don't. People see this as, um, depending on your point of view, you can see that centenarians live for uh, over 100 years old without developing any diseases. Nevertheless, they are subjected to the process of aging. Others live to 70, 80, and they develop age-related diseases. So I try to separate these two, and I would like to say that for the diseases aspect, uh, there are drugs that can be used. There are items, therapies, um, anything you can think of for osteoporosis, for example, you take a pill for uh, hormonal, uh, hormonal imbalance, you take a hormone, it's a pill or injection. For heart disease, you do an operation, something physical. So this, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the process of aging, the basic uh, biological events that happen in our body, which depend on time. So we see here in a small figure how these two processes are separated. We have the aging process, which results into age-related diseases in, a, in the clinical sense. And then at the bottom, we have the, the physical and the biomedical therapies, which try to diminish age-related diseases. But they have no, the red arrow indicates that there is no influence on the aging process itself. But if there is some influence, um, I haven't seen it. Maybe the people have an opposite view, but I don't think that physical therapies can affect the aging process. So we need to develop a complex approach uh, into, into this um, pro problem. So I'll continue with the item-based therapies. And you can see here a, a list of some tr treatments that are available today either for the public or are being researched for possible future benefits. Quite famous is the metformin. Um, we have the rapamycin, which is up and coming now, and other senolytics, 
Wu Jiaping um, started, I mentioned a few examples. Um, we have the, the, even herbs, herbal remedies, which people use either from the chemist, they buy it themselves, or in association with the doctor. Now, all of this is very good, and people stay up to here. I'm going a bit further, and I would like, as a doctor, as a clinical doctor, question this process. Because people say, okay, we'll, de we'll develop senolytics. Yeah? Okay. If you, how, how would it work in practice? You develop a pill, it has to be a pill or an injection or a suppository or a spray. How else do you give something from the outside to the inside of the body? It has to be an item. So as soon as we develop a pill or an injection, we run into problems that, are, that characterize any pill and any current therapy. For example, um, people may not take their medication. Uh, I know many people who, okay, they forget to take ordinary pills for headaches or for blood pressure and so on. But th there is research showing that people who have life-threatening diseases, um, HIV or cancer and so on, they just don't take their medication 100%. They may forget one day, they may take half the dose, they may lose their tablets, they may not have time to go and get a new prescription. And there are many other problems related to that. The people who have depression, which is very common in aging, maybe they will forget to take their tablets or cognitive impairment. How, how do we expect somebody who suffers from dementia to take regular pills for um, the fight aging, even if we develop those pills? So I'm talking here in a theoretical scenario. If we develop all of these tablets and th therapies that people talk about, when it comes to the patient, the translation um, aspect of it from the laboratory to the patient, in my view, would be very problematic. Uh, we have to consider side effects of the medication. So I can't see that it would be one, one treatment for aging alone. It would be different treatments. It would be a combination of all of these or, and many others um, that I, I, I list here. So we have to find the side effects, the interaction between all of these components uh, we have to see if people who are young and decide to take these tablets for preventing aging, whether they will actually take them because asymptomatic disease is, um, if, you have a, a, if you don't have a disease, then you don't feel so willing to take a tablet. You only take it when you do have a disease. And then we have administrative issues for example, follow up, we have to find the right clinics, we have to have the right, the right doctors and so on. And I would mention an example here. Um, somebody has said that, okay, it won't be only pills for aging, it will be maybe interventions like stem cell, stem cell uh, transplant. So you take a stem cell, you transplant it into the body of the person, and supposedly this um, under certain circumstances can fight aging. But how are you going to do this procedure? Has anybody thought about how to, do, how to take the stem cell from the outside of the laboratory and put it into the person? At present, it can be done through a bone marrow transplant. And, and then this opens up new questions. Who is going to do the operation? Because we are talking about many millions of people is aging, everybody ages. So it's not a few patients that will need this. Millions, hundreds of millions of people who will want it. So we want hundreds of thousands of surgeons, clinics to do it. Um, it takes some months beforehand to prepare the patients, then some months afterwards for follow-up. And all of these problems add up to the general idea that I want to present here, that 
attempting to solve aging as an individual, uh, as, a, um, as a mechanistic individual reductionist way is not going to work. So we need to move away from here, from this uh, aspect, and um, study aging in, in a more complex way that takes into account the environment, how we adapt to the environment, and see if there are any other not biomedical therapies for aging. And the way to do that uh, is to move from the current concepts we have on magnification. In other words, we mag magnify things. We take a microscope and we study the cells, the DNA. Uh, we, see, we, see, we see things under the microscope and try to decompose them in order to find a therapy. But what will happen if we look on the aging matter in, uh, in miniaturization? In other words, we move away, we move out, and we look at the human body in relation with everything else that there is around in the, in the environment. And there are uh, some favorite quotes that I would I like to mention, is that the complexity of the treatment must match the complexity of the problem that we want to treat. If you think about that, aging is a very com complex problem and we are attacking it at present with very simple and naive uh, matters, therapies. We can see that technology now is starting to play a significant part in our lives. So our environment is changing. Um, if we interact with technology, this creates new new situations in our biology. So it's not that things were uh, the same now as they were before. Things are now changing from the past 20 years and into the future 20 years. Things will change in a way that we haven't seen before because technology is, um, I mean, here, I, I mean, Digital technologies, not just technological developments, uh, bionic arms and, uh, and ways to study the DNA and so on. I talk about digital technology in our environment. So what happens? We are interacting with a computer. Now you are all sitting there, interacting and listening to me, passing on information to you. Information goes from the different processes from my mouth to the microphone and so on and reaches your ears and that gets into the brain. The brain has to assimilate that information. It is information that requires action, requires you to act, to think, then it activates certain parts of the, of the brain or of the neuron and it, it forces it, entices it, to act on the information received. But we also have information that is not uh, um, useful, it's trivial information, it's just sets of data without any benefit. So that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about high quality information spread through the internet through, by digital means. So this has an effect on our biology because it, it has to be assimilated and it has to entice us to act, to provide an action. In other words, to adapt to this information that we have in our environment. So just to go back again, I'm going to talk about the three phases of science as I see it. I think it's a very useful model. And here we have the first phase science, which is the commonest the, the science paradigm that we have. We have the observer and the observed, the, observed, the object of observation. And these two entities are separate. The observer with the black arrow observes the item of the observation. The observer could be a, patient, uh, the, a doctor, a physician, observing a patient. So we see the separation of the two. This is a reductionist uh, model. It has been around for a long time and we, 
the, we see that, that the observer is detached, completely detached, and it doesn't correspond to real life. In real life, things are not like that. In, in real life, the situation is extremely complex and depends on a wide diversity of interactions. It's not just one uh, interacting with another. So because of these and many other shortcomings of this model, there was a development of the second phase science where the observer and the observed, the object of the observation, are intermingled. Uh, in other words, there is a, an immersion of the observer in the process of the observation, which creates a more real life situation. A few examples here, just to make it clearer. We have un the unblinded clinical trials where both the, the, the clinician, in other words, the observer, and the object of the observation is the patient, freely exchange information. We have the relationship that develops between the psychoanalyst and the patient. This is a typical example of second phase science because the psychoanalyst gets immersed into the problems of the patient. And we have also real time therapeutic procedures which change according to the feedback received from the patient. For example, there are certain treatments, I'll just mention one, that may depend on stimulating the brain, direct stimulation of the brain with the patient awake, and the patient gives feedback to the doctor what to do next. This is a sec uh, an example of second phase science. I still don't think this is uh, appropriate in the study of aging. So we move to the third phase science, which is a better model in my view. And this, you can see here that uh, there are different observers that are interacting with different objects of the observation. They are all intermingled. So just to quote here, in third phase science, there are different interacting viewpoints which create more complexity and multidimensionality. The influences and viewpoints of the observer interact with those of other observers and the result uh, in, a, in a more comprehensive overall picture which reflects real life situation better. And here there is an important aspect when uh, interactions at the local level exhibit global effects. You can see here that one black dot, the local level, can have an effect on the whole of the system. And also global patterns affect local elements. This as a model is more akin, more akin to what happens in real life. I'll say a few things about something that I see as a bridge between reductionism and system thinking. Um, reduction, I'll show some figures in a minute, but reductionism is one side, system thinking is the other side, but there are connecting elements. And one of uh, these collecting elements is the molecular pathological epidemiology uh, discipline, which combines the epidemiology and pathology and focuses both at microscopic and macroscopic level. This is the, the whole uh, patient doctor treatment aspect as, as one and the whole. And this is neither first or second or third phase science. It's something that connects these three. In molecular pathological epidemiology, it studies the influence of the environment on genetic factors. So here we have some relationship with social genomics. I'll say a few things about social genomics later on. What I'm trying to say here is that it, um, the environment, the, the society we are in, affects the way our biology works in, in ways that maybe we haven't paid too much attention until now. So the net, the net result for a proper therapy is to see the patient as an individual. 
So we do um, uh, the, the unique disease principle, which sees the patient not suffering from a disease, but the problem which changes according to the age of the patient, the environment of the patient is in, the dose of the medication, um, all of these factors need to be taken into account in designing the, the proper anti-aging therapy. So if we talk, if we think back about the tablets I mentioned earlier, the different treatments that exist that are being researched and with the idea to be produced for the whole of the public, this would be a problem because it has to be designed for individual patients, the bio, uh, taking into account the biological and the social and environmental elements all together as they interact together. Otherwise, uh, the treatment will not work. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the concept of hormesis. Basically, what it is is um, low dose benefit high dose damage principle. So you take anything, any poison, which is um, given in a small dose, has beneficial effects. If you take it into a higher dose, it has detrimental effects. And the same is true with exercise. Um, you create mild positive stress, physical stress, in a small dose, it's beneficial. If it's, if it's in a higher dose, it's not beneficial. Here, I would like to mention the example of digital technology that I mentioned before. If we uh, see our exposure into digital information as a hormetic event, in other words, up to a point which is, creates beneficial adaptation and changes to our body, then this is good. If it's over and above a certain level, then it will create problems. Basically, hormesis takes, um, makes use of a stress response in order to uh, achieve adaptation to the, the stimulus that we are exposing ourselves. So this is a, an entire figure of the situation so far. You can see reductionism in one side and system thinking on the other side. At the bottom, there are the different phases of science which try to explain what happens and what direction we should take. The third phase science tends more towards the system thinking um, area. And we have the bridges between the one and the other, which uh, is for Mises, cyber, certain cybernetic laws, and molecular pathological epidemiology, which takes some reductionist elements and they expand them, help us achieve a more system, systems thinking aspect of aging. Now, a few aspects of the of systems thinking approach. I'll mention just two here. The non-additive determinism, which is um, a fancy way of saying that the system is not the total sum of its individual um, members, components. So you take individual components of a system, you put them all together, but the, there is something else which is on top of the total sum of these components. And then we have the reciprocal determinism, which is um, saying that if we take a biological factor and the social factor separately, we'll miss out because certain aspects can be more noticeable only we take, if we take the biological and the social factors together. In other words, if we take the patient in association with his environment, we may be able to see the beneficial effect. And I'll mention here an example of an experiment um, somebody some time ago gave some amphetamine to some primates and examined what happened. So they gave them different, different doses of amphetamines and at the end, in assessing each individual primate, did not show any significant effects. But when the social aspect was taken into account, 
In other words, the, the primate's position in the social hierarchy was considered. There were emergent effects which were not seen uh, when the, the biological uh, uh, study was done on individual primate. So basically what, what happens here is that and this is an example of the social aspects playing into uh, playing a part into our biology. Here, as I said, is the social genomics aspect of the discussion. This is becoming increasingly increasingly relevant because it studies complex interactions between humans and their society. So, social genomics study how the various social factors and cultural processes affect the activity of our genes. Socially originating uh, challenges, information, stimuli, I like the example I mentioned before of the digital information. Um, these challenges may involve biological responses like uh, changes in the genes, uh, in the microRNAs, in the DNA methylation processes, and so on. So this is something that may, uh, I think, it deserves more study, the so social genomics aspect. Here I wanted to mention an example of a more complex systems thinking approach to offering a practical treatment for aging. And this is the indispensable SOMA hypothesis which I, I developed and studied over the years. And it's based on the information of our technological ecosystem, so in other words, our environment, on hormetic style activation of our brain due to the information we receive from that environment. And then in details, which we won't go into now because it, it changes the point, and it shows that our brain response, our stress response um, is modified and uh, it may have an effect on our germline. So the germline and the brain, the neurons have a constant war going between them. The germline wants to live without aging forever and our brain now has mechanics, mechanisms to make it live without aging. So maybe we'll discuss that later. But basically what I'm saying is that if, if we subject ourselves to, if, to our technological environment, we will have biological benefits. Uh, this is a more detailed figure of, uh, of my entire point. You can see at the, at the top of the figure, we have the, the challenges, the positive information from, from the environment that we are in, and this affects the cell. With the either side of it, we have epigenetic influences, social factors, it's a more abstract and nobulous um, as, um, discussion, it's not something concrete. And this uh, may cause a transition from from keeping the germline, the germline in a good position to keeping the soma, in other words, the brain basically in good position. I think I'll leave this for discussion for, for later because it's, it's more complex. And there are certain mechanisms that can be operating when we are exposed to influences from the environment, mechanisms that have biological basis. One is the biological amplification, which um, as you can see, activation of one process locally has repercussions more uh, globally in the body. Uh, an example here is that testosterone, if we give testosterone to somebody, um, this may affect the sexual part of the body, but also increases bioavailability, bioavailability of antioxidants and improves the immune system. So one, one treatment affects different other parts. We have the challenge propagation concept. When, um, 
the, the adaptation following the stimulation can spread through the system and affect other parts of the system which have not been in contact with this challenge. We have selective reinforcement is, uh, which seeks to increase the occurrence of certain desired events. It selects something that is positive and deselects something that is not positive. This is something that is a general concept. I'm not talking about biology, but it's something that it happens in all aspects of life, politics, financial um, work, and so on. But it is also active in aging as well. And then acceptation, which may help our body develop certain ways to repair age-related damage without this mechanism being designed specifically for that particular repair. So to conclude and see if there is any discussion, I, here in this discussion I wanted to highlight that we need to move from simple reductionist thinking and stop thinking about pills or treatments or items that can be used in aging and um, use a more widespread system thinking model which has certain benefits but it's also more difficult to describe and study. We need to develop more intellectual um, uh, thinking, avoid clinically simplistic concepts and see how our body changes according to our changing environment. So I'll leave it here. Thank you. And I'm open for discussion if there is any or for questions. If there are any. I didn't check the, um, the messages, so I don't, I don't know if there are any messages, but um, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll answer them now. Excellent. Thank you very much.